Hey, this is Paul. Hey, it's Mark Sargent. Well, hey, Mark. How you doing, my friend? I'm doing well. Good, good. Uh, you ready to get on? I can, I can get this off and you hear a little pop and we'll be on. Oh, we can do it. I'm, I'm ready. Okay. All right. Okay. All right, let's see. I was playing a little Tim Wilson, if you're familiar with Tim Wilson. <laughs> let's see here. He's going to play First Baptist Bar and Grill. All right, should hear a little pop now. Okay, let me cut this down. Let me be sure we're on here. Hello. Hey, okay, hi, everybody. Y'all were just listening to a little Tim Wilson. And we have on the line... Mr. Mark Sargent, and I, Mark, I want to say Merry Christmas and <laughs> Happy New Year. <laughs> Merry Christmas to you as well. Uh, right, Christmas is coming up in two days. Yeah, Monday. Right, right Monday. Monday, yeah. Monday. And uh, I do want to uh, tell everybody, and, and they're aware of this, this is, I believe, the fifth time Mark has been on here, and he is so gracious to come on our our little show uh and we appreciate it so much and uh i did uh mark i i, I tried to do a little homework mm -hmm. i know you have been inundated with questions that were of a repetitive nature and uh does happen since, yeah. since you you are responsible for renaming this show strange strange world which i named in honor of your show Strange World, which are, airs every Tuesday night, 10 o'clock Eastern Time on Truth Frequency Radio. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I want to want to do two things with this interview. The first thing I want to do is uh, address the hundreds of thousands of people mm -hmm. who are flat earthers mm -hmm. uh, and believe that this reality is is not what we're told it is mm -hmm. but yet for economic reasons for family reasons uh they're in the closet right and i i, I want to dedicate this show to them uh because that's uh, that seems to be a trend and uh and there have been some very unusual reactions that that i'd like to talk about a little later and uh you know that's that's I guess the main focus of this, but I do want to to talk about some uh, things that you don't normally hear. But uh, first of all, did you hear the big news? And I think it was just announced yesterday. What? <laughs> Tell Donald me. Trump wants to go back to the moon. Oh, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. That's not surprising, actually. In, so in, how is how is this going to play out? Uh, is uh, is our old friend Joe Rogan? Is he working now? Can he uh, help with that in some way, maybe? Or no, uh, no. Don Kubrick is still around. Uh, Donald Trump talking about the moon is very much a second fiddle performance compared to Elon Musk. Who I mean, Donald Trump would say, "Oh yeah," but I mean, he Donald Trump has to say that being president of the United States because he has to justify the funding for NASA. So if NASA is getting twenty billion dollars a year guaranteed nowadays, you know, now that Trump has made his, you know, he signed a, a few different documents saying that no matter what happens, they always get their money, which is an interesting thing considering the budget concerns that are out there but he's whatever donald's doing is nothing compared to what elon musk has been talking about for the last calendar year which is he's just creating he's just pulling headlines out of his butt saying <laughs> he, he is every everything that he does elon musk it, he's probably my my new favorite enemy to, to the flat earth because he just the headlines he makes up are just horrible uh the the, the best one of course, which most because the people's attention spans are so short, is that he was that SpaceX was going to send two tourists, not not pilots, not astronauts, but two tourists around the moon and back, not landing, just going around the moon and back it, it, this year or in the next six months. That's oh, it, wow. he, he talked I about that. that. Oh yeah, he talked about this last year, or I'm sorry, this year, and said, oh yeah, we're going to do this, and, and I'm I'm looking, I'm going. 
that the the your your the, the timetable is the most aggressive space timetable I've ever seen in my life. I mean, I, I and my questions for him if he was sitting across me now, from me now would be okay. One, what booster rocket are you using? To, to do this uh, what what heavy load booster is it the falcon what, what, what an untested booster uh the caps no more silence yeah yeah what yeah what what booster that has never ever left earth orbit as and untested is you are going to use for this thing Two, what capsule also untested are you going to use for this meaning if you're taking two tourists how many pilots do you have do you have three is it going to be two and two is it going to be two and three because if you have two and three we've never put five people into anything ever even claimed even in the fake space program we never claimed to put that many people in and we, we don't have the names of the tourists that are paying for this because they're paying supposedly millions of dollars we don't have the names of the astronauts of the pilots supposedly they're doing this uh, it, no, there's no information he's just he's just throwing this headline out there the same i treat it no differently than i treat when he says oh yeah we're going to colonize mars by 2030 yeah, when when, oh, he's, yeah. Yeah, when yeah. he says stuff, I, and the, I mean, he's literally, he's just been given free reign to make up headlines and they'll report on it. No different than the Puerto Rico thing. So yeah, we're going to, you know, after Puerto Rico got swiped out by the, uh, uh, the hurricane, he, he comes in and says, we, oh yeah, it, SpaceX can totally solve their power problems. It's like, where are you, where, where are you coming up with this stuff? How are you even allowed to say this? And the press records it like it's gospel and then of course people forget about it like people, the, the press the media has already forgotten that he said he was going to send two tourists around the moon in 2018 they, they've already forgotten this and, and so this date's going to come by and no different than let me throw one out one more out here sorry i get off on rants uh, you're my my first rant of the day which <laughs> which is the uh, uh uh the google x prize People, people have forgotten about that. We're coming up literally to the drop deadline date right now. And that is in 2017, there were five, the, the $20 million prize to any corporation, any group that can send a probe to the moon and bing, beam back images. Right. Wow. But you had to, but you had to launch by December 31st, 2017. Right. And the, I remember this because I remember they announced it when I was up in Canada at the beginning of this year. And here we are, December 31st is coming up next week and there's nothing. And, and that's because they kicked the can down the road. A few months ago, they said, oh yeah, by the way, we're going to push that deadline date out to April of 2018, which means you're just going to kick the can down again. April 20, you, you wait, February of, I'm sorry, February of next year, they're going to announce that they're going to kick the, the, there is no, there is no Google X prize and the countries that were involved. It's not like they were ran, it was the United States, uh, India, Japan, the European space union and Israel. Uh, how Israel has a space program. I have no idea, but, but well, the, but these five groups were going to go. And anyway, so, so I'm sorry, Elon Musk, Donald Trump, and every other space story, you can just lump into one big group of crap, which is just space propaganda. That's all it is. Nobody's going anywhere. Well, one thing I know you have you have uh, been on coast to coast, and they are, they're very pro astronaut. And uh, I guess it was a couple of years ago I was listening, and um, they had John Lear. Uh -huh. And you know he's big into the you know secret space program, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. A lady called in and she sounded legitimate. Now who knows? But she said that she had worked in some some capacity for NASA and they were monitoring the Mars rover. Right. And during one of the times they were monitoring it, uh, something happened to the lens. There was a fog on the lens, and from out of frame a regular guy in street clothes comes up and starts wiping the uh, lens and they're all rushed out of the little observation thing yeah and she asked john Lear what was going on without batting an eye he said oh well you know mars has an atmosphere and we've had guys up there for years and years and years and and uh, he just went up there to do i, I mean not that, oh, well, it was done, you know, in a studio in uh, Hollywood, and it's all fake. Right. But, I mean, and, and it was just 
thought, okay, well, yeah, that that sounds good. That's, I mean, it's crazy. Well, that's it's just absolutely crazy. That's just it. Uh, people, uh, and I'll I'll talk about this later. It's not that people are we've dumbed down the population. I know I've been. Uh, I've said in certain things that it's kind of like the movie Idiocracy, where, but it's but it's not that. Really, what's happened is people still know a lot of stuff. Human beings like absorbing information, but their priorities have changed to where people believe a lot of things. If you told seriously, if you went to the people, average person on the street, and says, "Oh yeah, uh, we have a colony on Mars," there would be a fairly sizable percentage of people that would believe it. Why wouldn't they? Because they, we believe what the media tells us and we believe what science tells us. And even though, no, you know, any, any good, there's this huge disconnect between sci science-based people and non-science-based people to where, look, the, the reason, the big reason, even if you believed we, we could get to Mars, the, the biggest problem we have there is there's, it's a one-way trip. It's, uh, oh, yeah. it's, there's no, there's a fuel problem. Which is even if you again, even if you believe you get somebody to Mars, yeah, you'd burn up all your fuel getting to Mars, and literally you have no way of getting back. It is a one-way trip, if you even believed in it. So, which is why we don't go, you know, which is why they say we don't go anyway. So, what, well, yes, it, that's 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 the the reasoning behind the, the fact that it's on, painted on top of a dome or right or a projection on top of a dome, right. Uh, right. We have a, a local show, and I say locally, it's out of Atlanta by a magician, Michael Carbonaro, mm -hmm. and he's always doing ridiculous things, like he'll have an egg and somebody's watching it, and, uh, you know, a fully formed baby will come out, just crazy stuff, and he'll go through this elaborate uh, explanation of, about, you know, how it happened or, or whatever, and 99 times out of 100, they just whatever he says is just believed he said okay yeah. you know I, I, yeah. I believe it no matter how ridiculous it sounds people uh, people believe again we are accustomed to believing we don't like uh, just let me back up there's a there's an old i think it's a mark twain saying which is it's easier to fool someone than to convince them they've been fooled which mm -hmm. which is people don't believe in lies nobody likes to believe they've been tricked or lied to. Children do not believe in lies, which is why the Santa Claus thing lasts until what? Usually age six, five or six. <laughs> oh yeah. Uh, I, you know, I mean, and 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 we we perpetuate that for years and years and decades. Where uh, I, I used a clip in one of my videos uh, some some time ago, which was a CNN story that somebody had sent it to me, where Wolf Blitzer and the the Pentagon con, uh, correspondent. We're talking about how that Santa's sleigh was going to be escorted by F-18 fighters this year. And, and, and that some people were upset because the U.S. seemed to be taking control of Santa Claus. And not, <laughs> not, and, and not, not tongue-in-cheek. I mean, they were absolutely deadpan, the entire thing. And, I mean, of course, you and I know it wasn't true. But they, the point is, is that you find me a news story. Find me a local or national news story where they fess up and say that, you know, that Santa Claus isn't real. And they won't. They'll never, ever do it. And they'll say, well, it's for the children. It's one of those little lies, mm -hmm. one of those understandable lies, one of those lies we tell to children. And the point is, that doesn't change when you get older. People don't like believing in lies because it means they've been fooled. They've been tricked, which is amazing to me. Like that show with uh, Ashton Kutcher some, some years ago, Punked. And all the the variations of it now, I can't believe that it's it's amazing because they, those shows actually get pretty good ratings. Where you, Mark, can, yeah. can you keep on there? There's a UPS at the door, and he's about to have a seizure. If you'll just keep, yeah, on yeah, yeah, okay, him. yep, you bet. Okay, I'll be right back. Just keep on. Okay, so <laughs> yeah, people don't don't like believing in lies, but at the same time, we have shows out there where people are fascinated with watching other people get tricked. And there's this weird paradox there. So yeah, you, uh, you people listening to this now, you actually enjoy watching people get punked, but you don't like getting punked yourself. I hate it. I hate practical jokes. Never have I done one on any person. Uh, I, I don't know if it stems from okay. when... If okay. If he had been listening to the show, he would have known what was going on. Okay. So <laughs> the... Um, 
uh, it, it being being punked, being picked on, I, I never liked it because it reminded me too much of what and even now it happens. Even though it's twenty, going to be twenty eighteen, how bullies would would punk and pick on kids at school by tricking them with things, mm -hmm. uh, you know, whatever it is, doing screwing up something with your locker or all the old tricks you know, that, that that people do, and. Uh, so, but people do, it's amazing that, that again, it's a, it's a weird paradox where people will watch other people getting punked and, and, and being lied to, but they hate, they hate doing it when someone does it to them. It's, it's interesting. Right. It's one of those weird human conditions that always, always fascinated me. Sorry. You know, I thought about this. I'd like to get your take on it. I, just to me, uh, one of the things that's, going to be a, a very positive thing to to the idea of acceptance of flat earth mm -hmm. is these theoretical uh you know physicists that are saying we live in the simulation because if we live in the simulation what do you start off with right flat right. yeah flat. yeah it the it Every simulation that we build, I shouldn't say every, but 99% of the simulations that we build, and look, I'm an authority on this. I came from the development world. I, it's, all the best simulations come out of entertainment, and that's, that's where the cutting edge is. I mean, yeah, you can say the military has the cutting edge, but really entertainment is because they're motivated by money, and they seem to develop things that are faster. And yeah, the military may take advantage of it. But all the worlds we create when you're playing in a game like, oh, I don't know, Grand Theft Auto or Warcraft or Bat Star Wars Battlefront or any of this stuff, it all starts with a flat design, meaning the world the, the world you're designing is perfectly flat. It's, a, it's an enclosed, in fact, it's not just a, a flat enclosed system. It's usually a flat square Enclosed. It's like a box. It's like really like a, like it, has, a, it has boundaries. It has boundaries. Uh, computers don't like thinking in circles and they don't like thinking in spheres. They like thinking in angles because angles are precise. And by that, I mean, it, it's not when we're talking about simulations. The reason why the world is made flat in every simulation, again, almost except for the ones that deliberately try to make gl globes and spheres and balls is because it's easier. It's so much easier to make uh, because you don't have to deal with any sort of curvature. It's like if, if the people on the ground don't know, if they don't know, then what does it hurt? Then you can make it whatever shape you want and, and you can tell them whatever you want. In fact, something happened recently because, you know, as you may have heard over the years, uh, I have played Warcraft pretty much since its inception in 2004. You won a tournament. Well, yeah, I won a video game tournament, but, but well, actually, I did get a realm first in in Warcraft. I did do one of those as well. So yeah, that was fun as, too. But Warcraft, I know just about everything there is to know about Warcraft. And what was interesting to me was that up until very, very recently, everybody in Warcraft knew that the world was flat because the map was flat. They never ever showed you a globe. It was just this flat land in the middle of something. You don't, you didn't care where. It was just this flat map. Only recently, only in the last expansion, did I start seeing Warcraft globes, and what they and I saw this walking around in the game where you you go into this library and there was a Warcraft globe where they took the flat map and they just stretched it around a globe and they had it spinning and I'm going, whoa 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 wait and and if you're a kid coming into this for the first time, you're going to look at this and I go, there's your conditioning right there. The world of Warcraft is absolutely perfectly flat but because they show you these little globes in the libraries I bet you you could ask some of these kids it's like oh what shape is the Warcraft world oh it's a sphere no it's not no it's not but because they show you that sphere in there and I should take a screenshot of it and, and, and show people I mean it only happened very very recently with this last expansion when the flat earth things started coming out and that's how easy it is to condition people uh, let, let me let me go down a, a, another road, which was from the clues, where we can do this. You can ki basically kids believe in anything you tell them. You know, they're just empty vessels. We've all heard mm -hmm. that, right? And so when I was looking at the movie The Village by M Night Shyamalan, which I know a lot of people haven't watched, but it's an interesting, interesting movie because basically they they went out to these very rich people who wanted to shelter their kids from the violence of, of modern society. They went out to a wildlife preserve. They bought the really, just bought a wildlife preserve 
and then built a town from the 1800s, very similar to the Amish towns from the 1800s, you know, because the Amish are, are, are basically stuck in the 1800s. You're not getting out of that. No modern, no electricity, no running water. It's all you know, very, very basic. And they told the kids this, and that's what the kids believed. Now, what was interesting about that is what happens when those and the parents lived there with them and these kids were very, very sheltered. And then they paid extra for the government to make sure that no airplanes flew over so they didn't know what was going on. And basically they said, oh, yeah, by the way, kids, you live in the 1800s. Why, why would the kids believe anything different? Technically, they were living in the 1800s. Now, yes, the world around them was a hundred and something years in the future. But the world they were living in was the 1800s. Here's where it gets interesting. And they, they said, oh, yeah, you can't go into the forest. So they, they made out this boundary of the forest they said there's monsters living in the forest so you can't go out there what's interesting is once the parents die then it doesn't become a lie anymore because nobody is alive to know that the lie exists meaning the kids grow up they have their kids and so on and so on and this town exists permanently stuck in the 1800s and nobody knows any better and that's kind of like what we're talking about here. You know, once you have a, a, a just even a generation or two that go by, you don't need actors. You don't need anyone to know the secret. Everybody that's involved is completely on the level, so to speak. Sorry. My this, is, this is, and I, I don't know how big a, a concern it is, but it, 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 it's something that, that does kind of concern me. Mm-hmm. Um You've heard of the, uh, I'm, I'm thinking, I'm, I think I'm saying it right, Night of the Long Knives, is that long swords, I believe, and you've heard the expression of, you know, don't shoot till you shoot, you know, see the whites of their eyes. Yeah, revolutionary war scene. Yeah. You know, with, with, with flat earthers and people, scientists looking into simulation and uh, people seeing things that... Um, you know, like Mandela related that that the glitches in in the matrix concept of reality, those type of things. Yeah. Uh, it it if at some point my concern would be that seems to be something that um, needs to be get squashed. What uh, you mean? How the, hard would it be to squash it? You mean the simulation theory? Well, I mean, well, you know, it's the people that are proponents, you Nick Bostrom, you people like Tom Campbell and, and people like that. Yeah. I mean, you could probably take out um, a dozen key players and shut down a few, few YouTube channels and websites and greatly diminish the chatter. Well, uh, but but is that but is that what you want? Because technic- well, that's what I'm that's what I'm questioning if. And and particularly this thing we're going back to the moon is are, are we going to stay in the lie is is it uh, are we going to grow up or are we going to you know stay with the lie? I mean, oh no, I th- I think we're I think we're moving forward. The the amount of media that is now latched onto this. I mean, we're not even we we've got what there's like an online newspaper thing that basically collects all the stories, all the articles that are that are running on flat Earth at any given time. And this thing isn't a weekly or a bi-weekly thing. This thing is absolutely daily where there's so many stories coming out and there's a lot of big channels uh, to where the the hundredth monkey effect, and I still believe in it, it will happen. Uh, we're growing, I would, I would say exponentially because there's so many, I mean, judging by the amount of emails that I get on a daily basis, the amount of phone calls I get and the amount of texts I get, even though I don't text back, uh, there's a lot of stuff that's coming out. It's now we're, we're what was the um, the old saying, and that is first you get uh, um, uh, denial, and then you get heavy heavy debate, and or sorry ridicule, then heavy heavy debate, and then finally acceptance when it comes to you know the the resistance that you get. And we're in the debate cha- stage where just about every yep. major channel on YouTube, and I mean that. Every authorized, verified channel on YouTube has covered this topic at least once. And some of them are latching on to it more and more, mainly because of ratings. But I, 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 I am still very, very optimistic. How, how could I not be? You know, the national conference is barely a month old. And, oh, and it was a big success. Wasn't it was it? a huge success. It was a ma- I mean, I was interviewed literally 14 times in two days. 
when I was down there. And not by small players either. We're talking ABC Nightline, BBC, HBO, uh, Australian newspapers, French new newspapers, German television. I literally, I missed, I think, most of the... Was it the second day or the first? No, second day. Second day, I missed most of the presenters because I just kept getting pulled away to, to talk about this thing. And we didn't, a lot of these guys, we hadn't called them. They were just showing up on their own because they thought it was so interesting. That's one, also one of the reasons why this has resonated so well is it's the most novel, interesting thing that has come out in media in a long time. Uh, well, you said yourself you can only put so many naked people on an island and it'd be interesting. I mean, exactly, exactly. Well, did you did I ever talk to you about a guy named Terrence McKenna? Does that ever mean anything to you? That name? Mm, mm, I don't maybe, think maybe. So. He wrote a thing some years ago called Time Wave Zero. He was an interesting guy, heavy, heavy math guy that went into the South American jungle and did a whole bunch of drugs, and mm. came up with these interesting mathematical probabilities where he was talking that basically the, the what the universe runs on is novelty and, and he that said it would end by 2012 yes he did he said that it would end by 2012 now he thought that in 2012 when novelty ended because you could see it in his graphs it just literally just buried itself into the ground he thought that civilization would end in 2012 and I, of course it didn't, you know, here we are 2017 going to roll into 2018 and we're still talking, but I think it was something different. I think he was right about novelty, meaning think about what we've accomplished in the 5,000 years of unbroken civilization records that we have. All, most of the really interesting stuff we've done has been in the last 500 years. Think of anything novel that we've done, especially in the arts, you know, like the, the arts making up the, the five things, uh, two dimensional works uh, like paintings and stuff, three dimensional works like sculptures, music, dance and literature. Think of anything original we have come up with since 2012. I can't find any. They're all reboots and remakes and rehashes of older works. I think he was correct in that sense. To where, uh, do you remember the do you remember the old term, uh, uh, jump jumping the shark? Yeah, the, the Fonzie. The Fonzie, right? the Fonzie. Yeah. perfect. Anyone that's watched Happy Days, and, and it's now become a Hollywood coined term. When you run out of plot lines, you just go for a gimmick and then eventually just wrap up the show. And what we're talking about when we say jumping the shark is Fonzie actually went out to the beach and on his water skis jumped a shark for no apparent reason whatsoever. You know, it's like you always stayed, you know, at the diner or at, you know, at somebody's house. You never went out to the beach to, to do this. And it met, basically it means it's the end of, of the novelty for the show. And that's what I think we've done more or less as a civilization. We've run out of ideas. Well, one, one thing too, one of the uh, simulation proponents, one of, and I think he was a physicist, I may be, it, that part may be a stretch, but uh, he's a proponent anyway. Uh, he was making the observation that over the last uh, 20,000 years, our brain capacity has shrunk about 20%. Hmm. And he links that to, uh, because of our socializations, we, we, we don't have to be as smart and creative as we did 20,000 years ago to survive. I mean, you can be relatively stupid and live you can go to the grocery store and buy food you don't have to figure out how to plan right. it and, you know right. et cetera et cetera et cetera which really is the theory of evolution in a way yeah uh, even though it's on a simulation platform right it, uh, so i like to think yeah. of that in uh the the chinese book uh i think it was chinese boy i hope it was uh, art of war by sun tzu I don't think it was Japanese. I think it was Chinese. Uh, I think where he said that I, I don't necessarily think of it as uh, a process of evolution as I do the path of least resistance. He mm -hmm. it was very very quotable in that book. Where he goes, "People are like water. If you're going to take anything from the book, take this. People are like water. They will always follow the path of least resistance." 
And that is very, very true. Look at, for example, when we went, everybody thought that when all the tech heads thought when we finally got to the, the age of video phones, kind of like the Dick Tracy watches, when we got to video phones, that that's all anyone would do, it would be FaceTime. But it turns out they did the exact opposite, which was once we got to phones that could, you could text on very, very easily, since texting was easier than picking up the phone and less confrontational and less conflicting, people gravitated towards that to where people will be texting back and forth for you know for hours it's like just pick up the freaking phone but <laughs> but they don't and which is why by the way i absolutely have never sent a text in my life will never send a text in my life i don't care if the person's on fire on the other side it's like no no i will pick up the phone and i will call you because i can just hit information and hit dial and it's amazing that people will get me a surprise that i'm calling them it's like no i'm old school but the point is, is that people take the path of least, least resistance. So when we're talking about what you were just saying, where people, who, I know you call them relatively stupid. And from a scientific standpoint, you're absolutely right. They are scientifically stupid. They people, uh, in fact, there was something I, I told a, a reporter two days ago where I was saying, here's, here's the big difference. Because so, he was going, why is this resonating? so well why is this thing generating so much interest and why are people latching onto it i go the big reason is because we have now developed uh this big disconnect where the average person on the street and it might as well be a t-shirt the t-shirt might as well read leave science to the scientists because nowadays people don't even know or don't even be have a, the slightest inkling of scientific concepts whereas before they did so when i say uh, you know that people are more interested in who their favorite character is on game of thrones or a quarterback rating or everything that has to do every app on their phone they've got memorized and what you know they everything they've done on facebook in the last two months right they all know this stuff but when i say to them uh, yeah, so if I go 3.14159, so on and so on, they will have no idea what I'm talking about. Nerds will, absolutely. In fact, I, I said this to uh, the reporter the other day. I go, here's, you know, something, here's something you'll find interesting. So Flat Earth, as you know, we abbreviated it because people love acronyms. Uh, we abbreviate it to FE, right? Flat Earth, right? Mm -hmm. And I've used FE in so many things over the last better part. It's going to be three years now coming up in Feb February. Uh, you know, FE. Not one person, not one, has reminded me that FE is the symbol for iron on the periodic. Because they probably uh, didn't know it. They probably didn't know it. Yeah, it was because you have to know the periodic Perfect. table. Yeah. People, the, 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 your standard nerds that are out there, they know the the you know, pi out to 30 digits they know the periodic table they know all these things but now and and the general population used to have at least the concept of it back in the day now in 2017 they do not and here's why flat earth is resonating beforehand it used to be kind of a push you'd have people that, that could talk about flat earth and you had people in the science community that would talk about the globe earth and it would sort of be like this push. And it's like, well, I'll, I'll lean, the average person, be, I'll lean with the scientists because they wear, wear white lab coats and we kind of know what they're talking about. Nowadays, though, science tries to argue flat earth with math. They try to argue flat earth with concepts that the general population absolutely positively cannot understand. And so you might as well be playing them. And I'm not exaggerating when I say this. When science tries to argue, you might as well be playing them an old recording of a modem handshake. You know, that, that crackle sound where, you know, <laughs> when a, like a fax yeah. machine picks up. Yeah. And that's what we run into. And I know this for an absolute fact because of when we were starting off with this, when people were saying the curvature, the curvature of the earth is eight inches per mile squared. It, it, you'd be amazed at how many people when i said that to them their eyes would just glaze over as soon as they said that eight inches per mile all i had to do was say the word squared because they told they go holy smokes that's algebra i didn't pay any attention i was lucky to get through that class and i have no idea what you're talking about and even people nowadays you know we even when it still takes you a while to dig into people we still have flat earthers that will say oh it's eight inches per mile 
No, no, it's eight inches per mile squared. But they don't understand why it has to be squared, why it has to get more severe and severe to where, to where it slopes completely vertical. And that is one of the big disconnects. You want to know why, the, why this is resonating so much? It's because science has nothing. They don't have any concepts simple enough to counter us. And, yeah. and they're stuck. And so you, it's kind of like you're asking a nerd who has very few social skills. Very, you know, they don't have the capacity to dumb it down. And I'm going to take some credit for this because I created the dummies guide for flat earth. That's what really changed where it's like, okay, we've now created a flat earth theory, which is so easy to understand that anybody on the street can get the basics of it. Yeah. They may not be able to, you know, they'll have a hundred or 200 questions after that, but they can get the basics of it in under two minutes. Science has no way to defend against that. And they're in real trouble because of it. So. Sorry. Well, what, what I have noticed, particularly when I have been talking to people who were uh, very well educated, professionals, whatever, and mentioned this, as and and you like you say, you start talking about the eight inch drop per mile squared, and mm -hmm. you, you start talking about different things that uh, are to some degree provable and are logical and mm -hmm. make sense rather than to counteract those or to come up with a plausible reason, they just start insulting. Oh, well, you're you're right. you're crazy. You 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 know tinfoil. You know nuts. You know doing the little circle thing by the ear or something. Right. Uh, not defend them and you know not defending their position whatsoever. Right. 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 The um the the three things I try to tell people, and again I don't I don't mind the uh you know the way they they attack because it's at least it's predictable and that is look name calling is not a rebuttal uh profanity isn't a, re a rebuttal and yelling isn't a rebuttal uh, yelling is usually the the rarest of them but the first two they're they're pretty common which is people will immediately attack you personally they will just try to overpower you with profanity you know or or use the combination of the two and you know if you want to go for the trifecta they're yelling while they're doing this and it's it's yeah i i try to tell them and i'm i'm it's 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 difficult but at the same time i still have sympathy because i understand i was there i i know exactly what they were going through so when people come at me and try to attack i say yeah i know but do you even understand why you're upset about this yeah and that that kind of brings up another point mm -hmm. um and i don't know if this is an imagined uh thing on my part or if there's anything to it, there's certainly several YouTube uh, YouTube videos up there that address this issue of just the overreaction. Right. Um, and I'll, I'll give you an example. This is one by, and I'm probably mispronouncing his name, Rogato Bonner. I don't know if you if you heard that name before, but hmm. and it's not talking about flat Earth, but it's it's a similar thing. He's talking about. He was speaking with his girlfriend about the Mandela and, you know, this is still the thing, you're questioning reality. Uh, and she freaked out and maced him. Just absolutely <laughs> freaked out and maced him and screamed at him to never discuss that again and sat down and started playing Candy Crush like nothing had happened. Well, I could understand that part. Candy Crush is a fun game. <laughs> all, all the but, and, and I'm looking and, and, and I'm thinking of this. I actually had a little list down. The uh, and and I do appreciate so much. Uh, Mark sent me several people. I, uh, October twenty second, I had a paranormal mini conference uh, in Valley, Alabama. Here, and it uh, it was a nice little conference. We had several people there. It was live streamed on YouTube, uh, and uh, not on my channel. If you want to see this, if you don't mind me saying, it's on Brian McFarland's channel. You can scroll down and see it. But there were so many weird, just weird. Uh, things that happened uh, the Sunday before the conference that was coming up a uh, Saturday, my pacemaker basically the battery died. I mean, oh, wow. this battery was supposed to last another year, so I had to have like an emergency pacemaker put in. Uh, I had spoken to several people. I, I was trying trying to get advertising out in the Columbus, Georgia area, and and around nobody got back. Uh, the news people, nobody uh, came up. One of my main speakers, um, 
sent me an email and said that he was going to be out of town Saturday, and I assumed it was for the conference. So I said, well, that's cool, man. You know, we'll we'll go on. I'll do something. And uh turned out he was responding to a previous email and not the one I had just sent, and that didn't get cleared up till a few days before, so I didn't get to advertise him at all. Wow. The first speaker, about three to four weeks after the uh, conference, had three heart attacks and is still recuperating now. hadn't heard from him. Uh, it was just, uh, it was supposed to be beautiful weather the whole week. That particular day, it was pouring down rain and freezing cold. Um, I mean, there was supposed to be a newspaper article accompanying the, uh, event, and the guy called me the day after the, the conference and said, well, I'm ready to write that article now, and I said, what's going on? <laughs> you know, you know it was yesterday I advertised in your paper. Wow. Um. Uh, I mean, it was just one thing after uh, another. So that brings me to the question, mm-hmm. uh, and I want to go back to something that you said about astronauts going wild, mm-hmm. the hesitancy that the astronauts had in putting their hand on the Bible. Do you think that there may be uh, a supernatural force in some instances that, that work to kind of... Um, you know, hinder our efforts. Uh, I do and I don't. I think that I do believe in everything for a reason, and I do believe in the system, meaning that things are supposed to be rolled out the way they're supposed to be rolled out. Sort of like when well, I mean, start off when I when I did the clues. You know, there's no reason for me to do the clues at all. Why Why was I doing them? And after I did them then everything was happening unsolicited and I couldn't force it. You know what I mean? I wanted certain things to happen, but they seemed to happen in waves. So when the subject matter experts started getting a hold of me to create a base of subject matter experts for the Strange World shows, starting off with a Navy guy who call, called me out of the blue. And then once I had him on, I had all the other members of the armed forces and then the surveyors and then the engineers. And then all these other people that were tied to travel and everybody had something to say. Nobody refuted. Uh, nobody called in to, to go against the other guys and none of these guys recanted on their topics. But at the same time, every time I tried to f- force it, it wouldn't happen for whatever reason. Like, like uh, I will never contact a radio station. People will say, well, you should contact this show and this show. It's like, no, 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 I don't have to because for whatever reason, they contact me. Uh, or people contacted on my behalf. Uh, the, in fact, the one station I contacted because they, they said, oh, yeah, you should, this guy would totally have you. He, he didn't ever even, he, he emailed me a couple times and, you know, I, he, you could tell he just wasn't interested. But everything else, like the, the book people, when they contacted me from, from London and said, oh, yeah, I'd like to turn your clues into a book. It's like, oh, okay, you know, didn't think much of it. You know, you hear things from people. Uh, you, for whatever reason, this thing feels like it's on a track, uh, like a, uh, uh, a haunted house roller coaster type thing. You know, those slow moving, I don't know if you've got those, you remember them back in the day where you, mm-hmm. those, oh, sl- yeah. it's not, not a normal roller coaster It's one of those slow moving, turn the corner and this something scary. That's what it kind of feels like to where, yeah, you can sort of lean into a turn here and there, but the track is going to go where the track wants to go. And it works for both the good and the bad. Uh, When it came to the astronauts, I believe that with the Apollo program, and and remember the, the the powers that be, the people in authority learn from their mistakes. I believe the Apollo program knew what was going on, meaning they told those astronauts, they said, okay, not only we're gonna, are you going to fake it, but we're going to tell you why you're going to fake it. And it was too much for him. It's, it's too big, kind of like the lady that maced, you know, the, the guy. Yeah. It, it's, it's too big. It, in some cases, it is too big for people. Now, we don't have any stories of people jumping off the bridge and, and writing a suicide note and saying it was because of Flat Earth. We don't have any other stories, which is good. But it can affect people's... Well, let me interrupt real quick. If 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 the rocket guy that was going did 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 that ever occur? The guy no, was, he never uh, he never did. Now never, he's, never, well, he well, says he's going to do it now for the Super Bowl, which actually is perfect timing. <laughs> yeah. So uh, he 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 might really end up in more flat Earth than he. Uh, oh yeah, yeah. He could he could he could absolutely auger this thing into the ground, no question. And if he does, 
I, I will be sad because, yeah. but at the same time, if someone asks me, it's like, look, I would love to be in his place. In fact, if he <laughs> called me and said, look, I want you to be in the rocket instead of me, I would totally do it. Absolutely. Oh, really? do it because Would you? Really? Oh, oh yeah, I would. I oh, would. It was going to be launched off of Winnebago or something, wasn't it? Well, it's a customized, oh yeah, it's all, it's, <laughs> it's all, it's a complete junkyard rocket, which should be scary enough, but there is nothing I wouldn't do. I mean, they didn't have like Sanford and Son stamped on it. Oh, something. it's great. Now they've got the Sanford and Sons <laughs> theme song stuck in my head and, and the phrase, I'm coming to join you, Elizabeth. Well, I mean, seriously, though, if if the, if Mad Mike asked me to be in that rocket, as long as I didn't have to do anything special, like like you got to make sure you pull the chute at this certain time, as long as it's all automated, I totally go. Because well, I, I, I think if you went, Mark, the Lord would be with you and you would be safe. Uh, <laughs> well, if if it good for good or bad, look, everything for a reason, and I, you know, even. And you know how it goes. The, the the media, if it bleeds, it leads. The, that had you know that that saying is from something, and that is if mm. if it's super dramatic, the media wants to cover it. If Mad Mike succeeds with his rocket jump, great, the media will cover it. If he augers it into the ground, <laughs> they will cover it even more. They'll even be and that, and that's a sad state of affairs. But you know that's how it works. I mean, we, train train crashes, balloon crashes, uh, you you name it. You know the the biggest headlines have always been because of some sort of disaster. And uh, but but Mike tried, and honestly, him even getting to that point uh, to where he actually drove out to the desert. Oh yeah. He uh, he generated so many headlines. I mean, everybody covered it. We you could you couldn't put a dollar amount on the headlines that he generated just for showing up he generated a ton of headlines i mean everyone from npr to the associated press to forbes magazine to gq I, everybody covered this because it's an interesting story even right. though yeah. the headlines were completely wrong he never said he was going to try to prove flat earth by going less than 2,000 feet up for god's sakes there was mountains next to him not even 10 miles away that he could go up higher double that height triple that height he was doing it to promote awareness to flat earth and of course you know publicity to himself which is fine you know we we helped pay for the big stickers on the side of his rocket and that's great probably the 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 best money for bang for our buck we've ever had no play on words well it, it it does have that evil knievel kind of connotation even though in i think uh the the mandela people i think now it's evil knievel his name has changed somehow oh uh, no well i still we all know it is evil and by the way you're absolutely right this is straight out of the snake river 1974 yeah. uh gorge jump thank thank, thank. Thank goodness for the parachute. He was yeah. nowhere near. Well, you know, most and people... if it had been on the side, he'd been about slapped into the side. Well, also, he's, you know, it's not like those rockets. We're talking about the exact same rocket technology that, that Mad Mike's using. These, this, this is, there's no ejection seat on this. You are strapped in. You are not getting out of that. In fact, you couldn't get out of it even if you wanted to, which is why it's powered by uh, steam and not, you know, regular rocket fuel. To where the, the the little unknown thing about that evil Knievel jump is, had that parachute carried him actually into the gorge, he would have drowned, because really? he would. There's no way yeah, to. Yeah, he'd, he'd, he'd been in there. He'd been stuck in there, wouldn't he? Yeah. yeah he, there's no way to. There's no way to get out. So anyway, the point is, the I am glad that Mad Mike is doing this for the awareness part, but at the same time. I would absolutely put myself out there because people are going to ask, you know, if something happens to him, it's like, and I'd say, look, I would have gladly taken his place. Absolutely positively flown down there in a second and, and done this thing before the awareness of the, you know, the, the project. So I wanted to, like I said, I wanted that to, to hit some topics that maybe you've addressed or, or something, but, but weren't, um, you know, your traditional questions, mm -hmm. uh, one thing you had said before, and I, I do agree with, is that uh, probably the last president to really have a good knowledge mm -hmm. of what was going on was Eisenhower. Yeah, my favorite president, uh, by the way. There's the story, though, and I'd, I'd like for you to comment on it about, if you heard the story about Nixon and Jackie Gleason. Uh, refresh me. I have heard various stories about different presidents, okay. celebrities. Nixon but... and Jackie Gleason were friends. Jackie Gleason was supposedly interested in UFOs. Oh, aliens, yep, yeah. You've heard that story. Yeah, yeah, but go ahead. Keep going with it anyway. Anyway, anyway, Nixon 
comes to his house unescorted right. and takes him to a facility and supposedly they see an alien. Now, uh, I don't know if I believe it. I believe what you believe that there may well be and uh, probably is an advanced civilization that lives here with us sure. uh, that is much more advanced, that have crafts that uh, we are, you know, say come from other worlds or wherever mm-hmm. uh they they may not look like that i don't i don't know what they look like mm-hmm. but anyway that that was the story that uh and jackie gleason kind of was freaked out and didn't say anything about it till he was near death or, or something like right. that you know that right. the drama to it yeah. oh i i believe that story sure uh, now as far as that being an alien versus just an old, a different civilization. You know, yeah. that, I mean, s- technically, alien. You know, if you did run into another species, because we they can't. Would be alien. Well, they, yeah, they'd absolutely be alien, but they could tell us anything they wanted. Sort of like the kids lying thing. They could literally tell us anything they wanted. And what we'd have to take their word for it, because if we can't get to wherever they're from. They could say, "Oh yeah, we're from a million light years away," and meaning you know, but or they could be in the next dome over. But we're we're not going to know any different. Yeah, you know, so they and could... I'm glad you said that because that was kind of another question. You know, we we've got the, you know, UN traditional flat Earth map, uh, but then there are other maps out there that show land beyond the Arctic ice barrier. Yeah. Uh, could we be a dome within a larger dome? Sure. Why not? I, I've seen, yeah, I've seen some of the, the other maps, the advanced maps, where you have us in one dome and then there's other continents. The the one that was found by the, what was it, the Japanese mm-hmm. fishing thing, supposedly like a thousand years ago, a map where there's big, whole bunch of continents on the outside of our dome. The point is that we're sealed in and there could be a second dome on the other other side. You never know. Could be layers and layers. Why? Why wouldn't there be? I mean, you know, and that—that that was the whole thing with, with Nick Bolsom talk about was talking about simulation within simulations. Sure. And you know, how far, how far does it go, or how far could it go? That—that uh, that, by the way, I disagree with. Uh, mean this is a simulation, or that that we will be get to the we will be allowed to get to the point where we can make a simulation within a simulation. Sort of like... I don't, I don't think we could either. Well, because would, if you get, get to that point, you make this world irrelevant. And that I don't think... I think you're getting too close... You're hitting too close to the truth. And by that, we're talking about you know things like the 13th floor, which, of course, was based on a German film from 1975 called World on a Wire, which is amazing that you could even do a virtual reality movie back in uh, in 1975 but or or of course the matrix which is once we're, we're of course we're aspiring to do that we would love to do that you know and then everybody knows you know if you can think about it in science fiction it's probably already happened but you you weren't allowed to to find out now again is this world flat and enclosed yes could it also be made up of virtual reality things sure of course because then you're splitting hairs you know, what is matter anyway I mean, right. what, you know, I mean, pr- protons. I mean it, it doesn't make it less real. No. It's just, it's just a different take on what reality is. And, uh, you know, like we, we have talked before, uh, you know, if you go the Tom Campbell route, that we're individuated units of consciousness right. reacting to data, and that's how we're perceiving and surviving is, is by, you know, coming up with these things that allow us to eat and live and if, if we are a uh, something akin to an avatar or whatever sure that's that's what we know that's that's what we are yeah. so does I, it really matter no yeah. it doesn't we're, we just seem we of course when you're growing up you think about absolute reality but you don't even know what that means it's like well this is real i'm real this is real and it's like, well, yeah, but as you start analyzing the human brain more and more, you start finding out the other things, like the fact that electrochemically, which is why traumatic experiences like war, you know, where, where people, like the Vietnam thing we all have heard about, it's like people hear helicopters and think they're in the jungle and stuff. Electrochemically, there is no difference between a live event and a very strong memory. Meaning, and, and so it's like, okay, if you could alter something electrochemically, 
then what's the difference between that and the real thing? And that, what I'm getting at is, could you insert memories? Uh, do you remember the old, I, I know you're not that old, but do you remember the the old thing, the sports thing, where you're, it's always about thinking, thinking about follow through? It's always about follow through and the memory. And there was a funny, interesting sports test you may have heard about where they took a control group. Uh, they took three groups of people and into a gymnasium. One of them didn't shoot free throws at all. One of them shot free throws for like, I don't know, 10 minutes a day. And the third group One of them thought, about thought about shooting free throw uh, you know, for, for 10 minutes a day. And this was done years ago. And they always thought it was about memory and muscle memory and how you could sort of like mind over matter and uh, and that uh, it was again about follow through. You have to think about it. It's got to be. It's a me that sports is a mental game. And only later did they figure out that thinking about shooting free throws electrochemically was very similar to actually shooting free throws. Which and the, and that group did better. What, what I'm getting at is the people that just thought about shooting free throws actually did better than the group that just you know didn't do anything. They just you know went about their day. I had a uh, had a friend that his mother and father were both pistol champs, and one of their competitors would, uh, whether it was at the dinner table or at work, a lot of times he would just kind of look down and kind of take his phone, and he was you know mentally shooting right and he was you know he was great he was really really good but didn't didn't practice all that much live but he sure did a lot yeah mentally and and you know? and now we know that actually he was practicing that there mm -hmm. was there was, was making there's... those connections yeah, there was no, there was almost no difference. Um, the other virtual reality thing, which has got to come to mind to people, because we do this now in programming, and that is, and you've heard me mention it before, and that's the double slit experiment, mm -hmm. which it, I, I, I cannot stress this yeah. enough. I know it's tricky for people to to read a paper on the double slit experiment. Uh, you, you can get good summaries on it on YouTube, but the double slit experiment says that. Things don't exist unless a person is looking at it. Meaning what they were doing was they were shooting, uh, I think it was protons. Protons or electrons? Electrons? Well, it doesn't matter. We'll say electrons. They were shooting electrons through, the, through, through, through these slits and, and, and looking at the pattern on the wall. And when they weren't looking at them, they created a certain wave, you know, a certain pattern on the wall. But when well, some... Interference pattern. Yeah, an interference yeah. pattern. But when they were looking at them, or a camera was looking at them, meaning a, some sort of observational device that was tied to a human being, right. it, it, it everything coalesced and it became real. And the reason why I mention this is it solves the old question we all knew when we were kids, and that is, if a tree falls in the forest and no one's there to see it, does it make a sound? And we know the answer now. No, and that no is forest. There's no forest. Not only the tree not fall, there is no forest at all. The tree it's not rendered until the consciousness is there to render it. Exactly. You're absolutely right. And we know this. We it art imitates life, and life imitates life. We do this in programming now. Meaning, if you're in any sort of simulation, I don't care if it's educational and entertainment or military. If you're, in fact, Grand Theft Auto thing was, they did a perfect example on that. And that is you, you're driving around the city in Grand Theft Auto and you assume all these people are going or, you know, people walking on the street and there's cars going everywhere and there's people doing things. It's a very, very busy city. And you assume that busyness is there all the time. But the truth is, is the busyness is only, it's, you're only seeing the street that you are on. One street over, there's nothing there. It only exists in probabilities, meaning it only exists in code. It doesn't actually draw the city until you get there because there's no reason for it. Uh, think about this. If you're building a Hollywood set, right? And you're, you know, for a movie, you, the, the, you, the old joke, the old Westerns, that it was like you only saw the, the front, front side of, the, of the, 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 the Western town and the back, there was nothing. You walk through a door, there's going to be nothing there. And that is because the character, if they're never ever going to walk through that door, let's say it was a door to whatever, a liquor store. If, no, if a character is never going to walk through that door, you don't build the liquor store. Why would you? It'd be a waste of time. Why would you ever build a liquor store, put all the bottles in a shopkeep and the whole nine yards? Why would you ever do that if the character is never, ever going in there? And you can apply that to just about anything. So programming is the ultimate end of that. 
which is you don't build it. If, the, if you know the character is never going to be on the other side of that mountain, you know, the, you look at a mountain in a distance, you know he's never going to make it to the other side of that mountain. You literally do not draw anything on the other side of that mountain. It not It is not there. It is hollow. It is a paper mache mountain. And, and it's like, look, we, we, we do this now. We've been doing this for the better part of 20 years. And uh -oh. so don't think that the world is completely as solid as you think it is. I'm not trying to freak people out and scare people, but that's what we're well, talking about. Well, I mean, it's, I mean this, is what, this is what science is doing now. I mean, this is, this is quantum physics. This is, this is where we're at. You know, we, we keep going down from atoms to protons and electrons and quarks, and, uh, you know, we're down at pretty much at the Planck scale, and we still say there's still nothing. There's well, still it, it, by the way, that, that also reminds me is like, how can science criticize any concept when they can't even they can't even resolve their basic concepts meaning science loves they to can't come up with a good theory of gravity as far as I'm oh sure. hell they, i still it still bugs me to no end that the double slit experiment doesn't freak scientists out on a regular basis and that's it, because it it, it, it should it's a measurement problem it, it, it should well, if it should and probably does if you're a, if you're a Einsteinian physicist, it's it's just uh, you know it's just entanglement and spooky action at a distance. And it, but uh, at the same time, it's like you can't. I'm sorry, science cannot claim something and just say, oh, it's no, it's just an average science just because it's repeatable. Just because you can repeat the double slit experiment anytime you want, doesn't mean that it falls under the science banner. Because they still can't explain it. Because at the very least, you're saying, it's like, shouldn't that, again, shouldn't that creep you out as a scientist? Saying that, oh yeah, by the way, nothing exists unless a human is watching it. Mm -hmm. how, how is this not freaking people out? And don't get me started with quantum entanglement. That, yeah, entanglement is the big, is the big thing. That, yeah, it's, that's, that's a whole nother thing where it's like, oh, you, yeah. they still have no, no way to... Like, yeah. look, the speed of light's the speed of light, unless, again, unless you're talking about a manufactured universe or a manufactured reality. Meaning, uh, and I know I can't do this because it's radio, but if you have two galaxies, if you drew two galaxies on a piece of paper, right? And mm -hmm. you just did this right now. And you said, remember, because size is relative and time is relative. And you say, oh, yeah, by the way, those galaxies are a thousand light years apart. Well, how does one get from one galaxy to the other faster than the speed of light? It's like, well, you just do it you just take them there because because from the outside meaning it, it, from the inside of the universe of course you can't but from the outside of the universe you can do anything you want which is how oh, yeah. things defy physics that stupid ufo thing that was on uh, fox and i don't know why uh, i know it's the lowest common denominator and people s still get amazed by it but they say you know ufos defy physics as we know it it's like yeah because they're existing outside of our physics it's just as simple as yeah. it's as simple as yeah, that it, Sorry, go it's, ahead. Uh, I, I, to, to me, it's a rule set. We live, you know, in a simulation with a rule set. We wanted to say something. I think it would be interesting. I don't know how you could actually do it, but I think it would be interesting. Hmm. Um, you know, if you could do the quantum, I mean, not the quantum, the uh, double slit experiment, and rather than having a human observer, have, you know, one of these trained chimpanzees. No, it doesn't, doesn't work. They tried that. They, really? Oh God, yes. No, they put all know, sorts of organic things you know, next to it, like a like a. Um, well, you know, the the deal with with the recorder is if you record it and then destroy it and it's never seen, then it's going to be the interference pattern. But if the Human, data is there to be viewed, right. it's going to be particles. Yeah, which so, is how it it doesn't have anything to do. And I'm not trying to pick on people that that, that own animals. Because, you know, animals, you know, but they're different life forms than us. Meaning we are self-aware and can, and they say, well, you know, animals are self-aware. It's like, eh, okay, find me any sort of uh, higher level organism that has written a symphony or written anything or communicate or, or, or made a painting or a sculpture or, you know, there's, it, it seems to be, you have to have a sentient being, someone that realizes you know, that ask the question, who am I? Where am I in the universe? That's, that's what, you know, you put a rabbit in front of the double slit experiment. It doesn't work. Cause it doesn't it's, work. it's okay. a, a freaking well, rabbit I wondered, I didn't know. or a plant or anything for that matter. I mean, what's the difference between like a rabbit and a plant or yeah. uh, a plant and a bee 
or whatever it is. It, it doesn't matter because it because the bee isn't going to question it. The squirrel isn't going to question it. We, on the other hand, would question it, which, oh, by the way, leads me to the other thing. And that is, I think all life forms have some of those group updates, the the hundredth monkey effect. Do you know, are, are you kind of aware of the hundredth yeah. monkey? Yeah, yeah, that was, uh, that was really neat. It was about the washing the, the potatoes or something yeah and washing then, the yeah. potatoes on the beach and, uh, the, and, and you know on, on this island and then somehow they you know when enough of that particular group of monkeys on that island then monkeys on other island just inexplicably started yep. doing the same thing exactly it, it's and it and that is a huge and, and you have said this before it's almost like there's a hive mentality exactly at work well, that and a big update. And that is eventually, you know, if you have a, a, again, I don't want to lean too much on the software system, but that's kind of how software works, which is mm -hmm. okay. If this monkey thing seems beneficial uh, and, you know, let's just update all monkeys of that particular species. And that's what happened. It's like all of a sudden, click, click, click. And all the monkeys in that species, it's like, okay. And then all learned how to wash the sand off the potato. It's something that seems benign, but at the same time, it they're all connected. You know, sort of, you know, in it's, got, a, in, it's got some really interesting implications too, and particularly uh, fitting in with what what uh, one of my favorite shows to do is glitches in reality. And I've I've talked to people who, you know, have weird things happen. When I was talking to this one lady, and she said, she said, I've got a red car and a blue car. Okay. And there's nobody else that looks like me, and she she is does have a unique presence and she said i was going down my road one way in my blue car and saw myself going down another way in my red car and i thought okay and i've heard uh, i had a friend i worked with and she's coming to work she's a nurse uh she said on my way to work it's in auburn alabama um I look out in this field that's normally, you know, a good bit of traffic, wasn't too much traffic that morning, mm -hmm. and there is a group of Union soldiers that look dead tired, a just ragged bunch walking right, and our eyes, my eyes locked with one of them, and boom, they were gone. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, you hear stuff, and she has no reason to lie, I said, Please, you know, let me record this. And she said, "No, my husband won't let me talk about it." Why, <laughs> why not? I mean, crazy. why things like that do not surprise me. Coming from a development background, meaning I could give. Let me give you a small one. We've all we've all probably done this, and that is. If, uh, if people, again, path of least resistance, you use the a Word document long enough, you know, to use the same template over and over and over, let's say, you know, like daily events or whatever it is, and you just keep using that same steep Word document and you clear it out and you save over it and you save over it and you save over it, enough times, eventually weird things start happening. For no apparent reason, that document will start acting all squirrely. You know, you'll open it up and you'll be like, I thought I, I, thought I deleted this. And you'll delete it. And two weeks later, that same thing you deleted will pop back up for no, you know, and no developer would say, well, it can't be. You deleted it. You saved it. But at the same time, any, any good person, any good IT guy knows that computers still do weird, weird things to where even now, even it's 20, 20, almost 2018, even now, the most common troubleshooting thing for anybody when it comes to computers is what? Turn it off, turn it back on again. Or, you know, reboot it because eventually, whatever for whatever reason, software when it interacts with other software gets a little. You know, there's some there's some weird code overlap, and I don't. No one knows why. You know, we still. You know, there's no bullet, such, such thing as a bulletproof computer. You know, I'm talking to you now on, uh, through a machine, and I still. You know, if something crashed on this, you should see the the troubleshooting stuff I had to deal with recently. Where I'm not kidding you, where I got a new microphone, and this microphone reminded my PC that it had a conflict with another microphone. No apparent. <laughs> There's no reason for that to happen. And I could not resolve it. Once the computer knew, it's like, oh yeah, that other microphone, I hate it. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna do anything with it. I'm just gonna keep blue screening your machine until you get rid of the other microphone. And then I, to the point where I'm looking it up online. It's like, oh yeah, there's a known conflict. I'd used that microphone for the better part of 18 months. Hardly had any problems at all. But this new microphone 
its drivers boot for whatever reason conflicted and and made a created a conflict which wasn't there so when you're when your person says oh yeah she saw people and they just blinked out oh I'll, I'll give you a better one and i don't usually like to bring up other conspiracies but i i have to bring up this one and that is the whole because i'm in the northwest bigfoot and that mm-hmm. is do i believe in bigfoot i do but not to the capacity that other people do Meaning, is there a species of primate running around? I don't know, we're not talking about the missing link here because whoever these things are, they're way, way different. Uh, we're talking about a primate that's running around in the in heavily wooded areas that is almost undetectable by human beings and is extremely hard to catch. And you're saying, well, it, law of st- statistics says that that's impossible, right? Because eventually a Bigfoot's going to die. Right. You're going to find one on a ground or a hunter. You know, how hunters are. They'll shoot at anything. A hunter is going to accidentally blow one of these things away and they're going to, you know, they're going to get a paw or they're going to get a head or something like that. They're going to find one of these things. And then I heard a story about how a rancher. uh, People are going to think, Mark, you're completely weird when you say this, but it's like, no, no, no. You follow with me here. I heard of a rancher, this uh, famous story who was on horseback with a, I think a lever action rifle. I don't know if it was a 30, 30 or something like that, but he was basically at point blank with one of these things, you know, horseback. He had a great downward trajectory on him and he was right there, you know, in a clearing, the, 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 the Bigfoot was literally at the edge of the trees. There were no obstructions. He had him dead to rights. His rancher wasn't drinking. And of course, what do you think he's going to do? He's going to take a freaking shot at him and said he had him absolutely had him. And the Bigfoot just blinked away like it was never there. I'm so glad you said that. The, <laughs> the, the guy that I was talking about that had the heart attack, yeah. uh, Jim Smith is over the Alabama Bigfoot Society. They call him Sasquatch Jim. Yeah. Uh, I've had him on the show many times. He's He's been down here. He's a really nice guy. Uh, he will tell you that, that in his opinion, there is a dimensional quality uh to to these things and because it's it's like you said many times they just blink out or blink in and he said you know he said you'll be going down the road and they're just there in the middle of the road about there by the side of the road uh i also have done a couple of interviews with a guy on youtube the supernaturalist and he he pretty and this is kind of it's kind of going around the same thing he does a lot of uh stories about dogman sightings which we have actually had in in alabama in talladega county and uh, to just keep on adding to the weird fact a uh, dogman is something very similar in size to a bigfoot but it it has this um uh it, it's more aggressive and, and supposedly people have you know, pump multiple rounds into them, and they just they just walk away right. or or go away, or it's just something ethereal or unreal uh, uh, about them. Yeah. And um, I I can almost t- I can tell you the the software equivalent for what we're talking about here because we make these things now. Only they're not Bigfoots, and people get people are going to think, Mark, you're absolutely out to lunch. Because like, no, something we make it's called a treasure goblin which a is treasure goblin. treasure goblin which is a really really hard dimensional thing that that you sometimes you can kill it and sometimes you can't and it's 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 it hides almost compl- always out of range it's just out of your range but if you're fast enough it, you know you might be able to track one down but it's it's made very very elusive deliberately because it's like it's like okay if bigfoot again i don't want to go into the bigfoot path too much but if bigfoot is an interdimensional being what is it like an interdimensional hippie that smells really bad and scares off animals because you know no animals come near it and other animals don't fight with it i mean the all, all other animals avoid it like the freaking plague which is also interesting you know you think okay well that's got to be built in because if it is such a it, like a, a a being that's that's gen, you know moving around and doing all this stuff and if it's benevolent and sentient then why does it never ever ever talk to people ever mm-hmm. why doesn't it draw on the ground and say this is where i'm from i think it is a just a, one of those cool little mystery things that is put in there to just kind of, because people human beings love a mystery 
Well, you know what Tom Campbell would say mm. about things like that. It's, it's things in the program that the creator designed to make us question the program. Yeah. Yeah. I, I and It always was. Now, the same token, again, not to go off too much here, I do think that Loch Ness is, is, a, is a real thing, but I don't think anyone's going to be catching one, a live one, anytime soon, because that's sort of a, a water version. Do I think it's a plesiosaur? Yes, I do. Uh, do I think, you know, what's the, where's the best place to hide it in a big murky lake, <laughs> you mm-hmm. know, up in the middle of, of, uh, England and, or wherever Loch Ness is, I can't remember, but the, uh, but no one can find it. You know, yeah, you get some vague pictures. People say that they found it on land, but it, it really puts into question things like carbon dating, because if it is a plesiosaur, then what happened over the last 200 million years, if you believe mainstream science? See, I don't think carbon, I go off on a separate tangent, I think carbon dating is complete. Let's just throw that out the window. Oh, yeah. Uh, not, yeah. not a chance. I think that there's some, yeah, are there some major changes made between civilizations? Yes, they do. Uh, that's why we have historical breaks. That's why, you know, look at the things that are, that, that are here. Forget about the, the, the potential dinosaur thing. Things that are lying around, like the sunken cities off of Japan or the sunken cities off of India or the Bosnian pyramids or the actual pyramids. You know, look at those things. Or Bimini Road or Atlantis. These are all real. Well, except for Atlantis, we can't find that. But Bimini Road's real. These are, you know, structures and buildings that lend to other civilizations. Do I think massive changes are made between version 6 and version 7 or version 5 and version 6? Yes, I do. Do I think they take hundreds of millions of years? No. No, I don't. Why? Why would you? You're not going to waste that much time. But you know, you just make some alterations because time is relative. So, sorry, that's my. If 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 there is, and I think there's a very strong possibility there is an advanced civilization living among us that has been here since before we were here. Oh yeah. You know, the, the whole thing about the missing link is crazy because it'd have to be like 20 missing links, and yep. it's just basically, you know, you 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 had your Neanderthal and then Homo sapiens and nothing in between. It's right. just really right. But anyway, if if they're here and you could contact them, or they would, or they could contact you, what questions do you think you would ask? That's kind of a real. Um, I'm a little different from from most people, meaning. Uh, I, there's a lot, I know there's a lot of common questions that people would ask. You know, one of the first questions you would ask anyone, especially if you could tie it to God, would be, why do you allow bad things to happen to good people? Uh, or, but, but that's not one of mine. Another one would be, you know, do you have God's phone number, which is you know, your standard thing. It's like, do you, that, the standard questions that theologians and scientists, you know, what is the meaning of life or what, what else do you know about the universe? Uh, for me, it wouldn't be that it would be what role do you have? I wouldn't want to know too much. I mean, and again, I'm a little different, meaning I don't, there's a reason why I didn't go into hardcore development. And it was mostly because I didn't want to look behind the curtain too many times, because if you look behind the curtain you lose the mystery, you know, the whole Wizard of Oz thing. Once, once you look behind the curtain, well, the wizard has no, he loses his, his yeah, he loses his menacing qualities, but he also loses his magical qualities. And right. I'm a big believer in, you know, the tingles in the back of your neck and those cool, special, magical moments. So I'd want to know some things, but I wouldn't want to know too much. I hate being greedy along those lines. I, I would, I, I would, I would just, I would, I would ask enough to get me to the next level, but I wouldn't go any further. I, I'm not. I'm not a guy that, that goes to the end of the end of the book. I am not a guy that forwards to the end of the movie unless I'm just irritated with the movie in general. Then I just like, okay, what am I? Am I missing any relevant crap? Uh, but the rest of it is like, yeah, I kind of want to know. I, I like good storylines, and I like to see the storylines evolve naturally. So I, you know, if a golden spaceship landed in the middle of Africa and they came out, I wouldn't want to, even though I've been known to cheat on a few things in my life, a few tests and a few things here and there, I wouldn't necessarily want to cheat there. I'd want to know, I want to see, I want to be with everybody else and sort of seeing what everybody else asked. I'm, I'm more curious on, on that. You know, there's a, there's an old saying in that as you learn more by people tend to defend always the same way, but they, they attack in, in many more 
different ways. And so I'd kind of want to see, an attack isn't probably the right word here, but I'd want to see what the line of questioning would, would be from the masses. So. Yeah, I, I just, I just kind of wonder if they have isolated themselves for, from us yeah, maybe we just. Uh, oh no, I think it's. I think it's not to pass on the neighborhood. Or something. Yeah, I think it's a protocol thing. I mean, it's it's obvious they are not allowed to interact with us, uh, for a very very deliberate reason, and I think <clears throat> I think most of that's because uh, of uh, that that they would influence to us too much. Even now, I mean, look at look at the headlines. How fastly the uh, how fastly wow. How quickly the uh, the headlines were spinning up during the Roswell incident, meaning oh, yeah. I mean, they were spinning up fast. And remember, we didn't even have really television back then. This was just radio and newspapers, and everyone because it was so so interesting, and it had so such huge ramifications that the United States military military decided to squash it very very quickly. Uh, again, the fifteen sixty one Nuremberg event to me. Yeah, that's that's crazy. I heard you. I heard that for the first time listening to one of your videos, and that's that's amazing. Yeah, I had never heard that before. Most people haven't. It's and you've got to look at the woodcut to to understand it. I mean, to know that two giant space armadas were just duking it out over one of the biggest cities in Europe at the time, and then a third faction comes in, which had a higher higher ranking than these two scared the other two off and they were obviously more powerful because they only did it with one ship one giant black ship and uh, it, and it lasted for so long that the, the the city you know they didn't have photography back then they, they sketched the whole thing out and they had no scientific reference to this you know the, the science fiction no. wasn't even a term of course we'd look at it and go oh, yeah it's something out of star wars or star trek or so one of the, one of those franchises, but this was amazing. The uh, the amount of uh, the detail in the woodcut is is you know it's a Wikipedia entry. This is not even uh, a secret archive. I mean, this is a full blown newspaper which you can look up, and and it's they're sitting out there in the museum archives. And people, you know, the only reference they had was biblical, which was oh, it's got to be a sign from God. But the truth was, we, we, we can understand it now and look at it and say, oh, yeah, it was a, it was a three-faction space battle that happened to be too low to the city. Now, but it raised so many questions. It's like, okay, who were the first two groups? Why were they at war? Or was it a war? Was it like a turf battle? Why were they fighting over the city when it was obviously against protocol because the third group showed up, you know, the, 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 the big black angular ship? And then it's like, okay, then who are those guys? Are they the cops? Are they the UN? And but the bigger question to me was like, what? Why did it take you guys a full hour? What sort of response time is that? It's like, look, I can go down and pull a pull a gun at a donut shop. Cops are there in five minutes. You, these guys took an hour to get there. It's amazing. Uh, yeah, I'm looking at the I'm looking at the wood carving now. That's yeah. A, that's a wicked looking black ship yeah that black ship was pretty scary looking this is yeah it was, it was big but it's it's kind of reminiscent of what people have even seen around here is the triangles but it's a more of a sword looking yeah that like third ship was stuff. really interesting but the other two factions were flying aircraft carriers that came in these giant tubes and launched fighters perfectly wow. clear clear april morning people say oh it's sun dogs it's like what yeah, april sun 16th 1561 yeah, 1561 Nuremberg event it is the greatest UFO sighting in history, and 99% of the people on the street have no idea. And, they, they, you know, I was in MUFON. I was a, uh, a field investigator, and I had never heard of it. No, no, it's it's just not talking. Well, mostly because it's not American. You know, the, the, the two big American ones would be Roswell and then the 1899 Aurora event, Aurora, Texas, where a ship just crashed, blew through a windmill, and then they buried the pieces in a well, and anybody that used that well got horrible and they moved they buried the alien supposedly and somehow or another the uh headstone got moved i guess yeah well traffic. you know yeah you know the government was going to have to get involved eventually oh, yeah. but yeah. there's a lot of i mean i love this world in terms of the little mysteries and the little nuances that are out there but the fi the 1561 nuremberg thing caught my eye um mostly because when ancient aliens uh, the mainstream 
uh, Aliens show started talking about it. When they covered the event, they deliberately left out the last, the, the black ship that came in. And that's because it adds a whole nother dimension to the narrative. I mean, it's like, okay, at that point, you're, you're creating a level of detail there, which really adds to the credibility of it, where it's like, okay, you, who are the, wait, wait who are the, where, what's the hierarchy? What are the protocols? Meaning these guys were obviously not supposed to be fighting over a major city. And that that's obvious. You don't want something like that to happen. That sort of thing happened like even as, as late as the 1800s. It would have gotten a whole different, you know, especially photography would have gotten involved. You had to make sure that event didn't happen anytime after that. Uh, ever, now, now, of course, you know, UFOs keep their distance. It's almost like they have moved out they, they're not allowed to come in. They're only allowed to come in uh, beyond visual range, meaning, you know, we've got some great HD cameras out there, and yet we still don't have any decent UFO footage. It's like whoever's, you know, whatever these groups are, they know the level of technology and they know it's like, oh, yeah, by the way, HD, HD cameras have been invented. Your, you know, minimum safe distance is now 30 miles. Or whatever yeah. it is beforehand it's like you could come i mean think of all the great alien stories I and mean, you want to read a a great book it's called the case for the ufo uh by a guy named jessup and he was talking about like even before camera technology or just before camera technology there were close calls all the time big big ships flying over all all sorts of things but people had no reference points to it they the science fiction didn't exist any at once the 1950s happened once you had movie science fiction movies notably the day the earth stood still and when worlds collide and yeah. all this other stuff once Klaatu, was that the robot yep tonight? yep Klaatu. Klaatu. uh and that was also a band that uh many people thought were the beatles last night Klaatu? Klaatu. Oh, that's funny uh, but but yeah once once we had science fiction built in then you really couldn't have any close calls so, but it did help us with our understanding of it because if it wasn't for science fiction, I wouldn't have been able to, you know, break down the whole unified field engine where people, the, the reason why UFOs can, can move around and defy physics is because they're using a propulsion system that is similar to what we have in science fiction, even better actually than what we have in science fiction. You don't see Star Wars ships and uh, Star Trek ships moving the way that UFOs do. Which I no, think is and I think the last time we had talked, uh, I told you about the sighting that uh, me and my friends had yeah. in the 70s, and and you explained that to me, and it made perfect sense, because the thing that bugged me is that even though this was, well, probably in October or something, there were a lot of leaves, a lot of leaves were falling, this thing was right above treetop level, Right. Took off at a tremendous speed, not a sound, not a leaf fell, yeah. nothing, not a, no wind, nothing. Yeah. And it, that's, that always bugged me. Yeah. It's, well, again, it would bug you because conventional aircraft are, have to follow a certain set of rules. You know, propulsion system, if you're using the atmosphere, then there's only certain things you can do. And by the way, you're also having to work with gravity, but a unified field theory disregards all that. You doesn't care about atmosphere. It doesn't care if you're in water. Uh, and, it, and it definitely doesn't care about gravity because that's the whole concept of the engine. A uh, unified field, meaning the relationship between gravitational waves and electromagnetic waves, meaning and you know, creates a bubble around you. And the inside that bubble, you are immune to pretty much anything when it comes to physics. So uh, at that point, you, the, you can fly basically like if you, oh, you know what? You know, I, I just thought of this. You would fly the exact same way that Willy Wonka des described his elevator, that magic elevator at the end, where he says you can go sideways and backways and, you know, front ways and, yeah. and, and go oh, yeah. any, any direction you want. Yeah. Multiply that by any speed you want. That's the part that really throws everybody. And 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 that's what I saw it do. Make a big Z like the the Zorro kind of deal. Yeah. And going yeah. At, at hundreds and hundreds of miles an hour, and there's just no way. You yeah. Know, we could do. Well, let me ask you, because of your computer background, mm -hmm. uh, and this seems like a weird question because I think everybody just assumes it to be true. I'm not so sure. Uh, do you believe that the that the D wave is is doing what its creators and uh, 
people and you know sponsors or whatever say th- that it can do that it can reach out into other dimensions and grab information and you know find the one you know it's a nexus point for all you know dimensions and it can reach into that dimension that is you know exactly like ours except for that one cubic and use that cubic and do calculations and maybe uh, but at the same time you got to remember that whoever built this place is going to have safeguards built in to where whatever they're doing they're not going to be able to break the fundamental rules of whatever this is meaning kind of like uh let me give you a, a, a perfect example well maybe not a perfect example but a decent example which is astral projection people mm-hmm. you, you probably met a few in your time astral projection people have gone have been doing this for quite a while and yet up until the flat earth concept came around in late 2014 2015 you didn't have astral projection people saying that it was flat or domed because you would you know that's that's an obvious thing i think astral projection is real but i think that you would also you know it's just another uh vibration so you would you would make sure that whatever you built here would be immune to that and only now are they revisiting because now it's like oh well now i see it remember they couldn't see the forest for the trees or the conditioning that they had and i know we haven't really gotten into it that much and we have a little time left the about why people get so upset when they hear about the, the the flat earth and that is if you're conditioned to the globe so much it's going to affect everything you do including astral projection so take that to what we're talking about quantum computers and that is quantum computers are still only going to be able to reach as far as the builders will allow them to reach you see what i mean Kind of, mm-hmm. the, there's only so far they can get, and and you know, are they going to tear the fabric of space? No, no. This this thing is bulletproof, uh, for lack of a better term. Uh, you know, the w- the mankind has been trying to bust out of this thing in any way it can. So if atomic weapons weren't going to do it, let's use the harp technology based on frequency. If that's not going to do it, let's use CERN technology. If that's not going to you know do it, maybe we can probe around with quantum quantum machines. Yeah, they'll they'll do anything they can because they, they think they're remember information is the ultimate power and if they think they can grab something and use it to their advantage they're gonna they're gonna give it a shot but the system is flawless at the ultimate end the the system is flawless there's only so far you can go before you run out now you may be clever and may be able to make it to a certain boundary but eventually that boundary is going to not let you go any further. It's n- sort of like the, um, the the digging of the deepest holes at eight miles. Remember, you, you're digging yeah. down. It's like, you know, the Soviets and the Germans. It, it took them, what, 12 years to do that? Yeah, yeah. And then once they got down there, they tried for years after that to see if they could breach the eight-mile barrier. And they could never do it. And I'm, I, and, you know, of course, it was me. And if I had unlimited funds and if I was in the military, I would just start dropping... Uh, atomic weapons you know to a certain depth you know just start you know because you could blow basically one mile holes with atomic weapons and after about eight or nine you should be able to get down there right i wonder what happened if they tried if they kept doing it underground if they could go any deeper than eight miles and if they found a barrier past that basically i'm saying that you could only go so far they're going to let you go like with anything else that's built you can go so far but but eventually you run into a barrier that is going to it, it it's going to be the end it's 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 the outer boundary and that again which is why the the globe model is perfect for us because it lets us know that we you know it, they, then it's just the limit of our imagination because then it's like oh wow the universe is incredible let's think up of all sorts of stuff like klingons and romulans and Darth Vader and all that fun stuff. You know, we'll just keep going with our imagination. We don't have to do it for real. And for the most part, that's what's worked. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, one of the physicians I work with uh, met when he was, uh, I don't know, he used to do something in, in the airport. Uh, who who was Captain Cook? William, what's his last name? Strat- Stratner, Stratner or something? Mm. Oh wait, wait! The guy that was working at what, air, what airport? What? No, no. Well, the the uh, Captain Kirk on Star Trek. Oh, Shatner. William, William Shatner. Shatner. Bill Shatner. Bill Shatner, Shatner, Shatner yeah. Yeah, he was not impressed. He said he was 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 very uh, unapproachable. <laughs> 
to 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 say it mildly. So, a lot of our heroes in in real life, I don't think, uh, necessarily live up to their. Well, uh, that that persona. that goes with anything, though. I mean, the the characters yeah. that we that we create. I mean, it doesn't have to be science fiction or even heroes. Uh, I feel I feel bad that one of the most common stories is uh, that Patrick Stewart, at least for a while anyway, hated. He I mean, remember he's a stage actor and mm-hmm. he he hated playing Captain Picard on Next Generation. Hated it and he was pigeonholed. I mean, and it was a very successful show and it was it was success mostly because of him. He added a real depth to a char- to characters that normally were pretty canned. You know, and and he was a he was a he was a great guy. And then of course later he did the you know the Professor X thing and he was in science fiction basically for the rest of his life. But the point is is that you know a lot of people you know they we create the characters but rarely rarely do they have anything to do with the actual person. It's just a combination of writing and casting and you know you luck out and and I feel bad in fact I was thinking about that the other day. It's like if I ever ran into a celebrity I think I'd feel bad about, you know, because you, you, the cliche is you would bring up, uh, you, you'd want to bring up something that they did, right? Oh, I loved you in this. Oh, I really admired you in this. But at the same time, now that I've read so many stories about so many different actors where, you know, they hated this, it's like, you, you, do they want to be complimented on something recent? Do they want to be complimented on their most popular thing? Do they want to even be talked to at all regarding their career? And uh, and that's basically what uh, what he told uh, this doctor that uh, just basically leave me alone. You know? Yeah, some guys are like that. Know, he could have just had a bad day. Uh, like, um, who's the guy that, uh, the, the guy that played the, the lead in Stargate? Uh, Richard Dean Anderson. Uh, when I was at, and I know I'm a geek for saying this, uh, I went to Comic-Con, you know, for vacation once. And he was, you know, the, a lot of the other Stargate people were there, but he does not go to those things. It's like he's only doing it for a paycheck. There's some yeah. people, it's like he just does the work and he could care less about the fans. He could care less about it. And of course, that's going to happen with a lot of them. And I was like, look, I just want to be, it, but it's that paradox. You know, they want the love. Until, they're kind of like cats, aren't they? <laughs> It's like, it's like, it's like, pet me, yeah. pet me, pet they're, me. They're, Stop they're, petting they're, me. <laughs> that's that's really what they're so, like. You, know, you pick up a newspaper and they're all over you. You know, once you ignore them, they, you know. Yeah, them. exactly. Uh, yeah. I saw something I wanted to to bring up, and you may well have seen this, but I thought it was kind of interesting. What? Um, it was some uh, film footage of the X-15 at 65 miles up when it first made 65 mi- miles up. Mm-hmm. And the horizon shots were perfectly flat. And I don't know if, if that, you know, if that's not high enough or whatever, but I thought it was interesting that they didn't try to artificially, you know, curve it or anything. Because this would have been in the late 50s. Right. But um, that was pretty neat. Uh <laughs> Another thing I wanted to run by you is I heard a interesting uh, idea or concept of gravity, and it it kind of works with the uh, idea of of a simulated reality. And it says basically the rule set to this person that came up with this is that things go from a state of of lower probability to higher probability. In other words, it would not be very probable to have an iron anvil suspended in midair. It would be much more probable to see it on the ground. I'm probably oversimplifying what he said. Okay. Uh, but it, it it sounded better than what we got. I mean, you know, hmm. I don't know. It sounded pretty good. Uh, you know, when it comes to the gravity thing, and you've heard me say it, where I believe in gravity, I just don't. I mean, uh, gravity over the whole buoyancy thing. Because we build, and you guys can look this up, uh, you know, we build things called physics engines in uh, any of the simulations we do now. Meaning we build, we literally have to define gravity. And you say, okay, this object's going to, well, no, we don't take into account vacuums and, and atmosphere, you know, the how atmosphere gets thinner as you get higher or anything like that. But the other, all the other stuff, you have to say, oh yeah, the an object will fall to the ground at this certain speed. And, you know, and you can make it anything you want. You can, that's, that's what's great about gravity. You know, in, in the physics engines, you can say, oh yeah, this object weighs five pounds. It weighs 20 pounds. It weighs a thousand pounds. And so when people talk about buoyancy, 
I don't necessarily think you have to you, you have to use buoyancy to explain the atmosphere and gravity simultaneously. I think gravity is still just molecular magnetism, which is no different than what really what uh, mainstream science defines gravity now. A magical force that pulls everything down. The only difference between my version of gravity and the globe's version of gravity is that I say it pulls straight down where the globe says it's pulling straight down towards a cur you know towards a, a core at the center of a sphere other than that they're they're basically the same thing uh, but my my big my big question that I've been because uh, I've been working on debates with scientists recently and I'm hoping the Georgetown one will get back to me. Yeah, pretty. Georgetown and UCLA. Yeah, the UCLA A one, which uh, should be coming up. Well, won't be coming up until the until 2018, but pretty soon. Uh, which is hopefully I'll be going up against a panel. But the Georgetown one was video call to video call, meaning you know I pro propose questions and then you know he watched my video of it and then he would respond with videos of his own, and that was done by a, um, a German team. But the, one of the questions I threw out, and the reason I mentioned this, is because we did one on, on gravity, where was, okay, the atmospheric pressure that we all know, right? It's, it's a called that for a reason. They say, well, it's called that because, you know, it sits, it's like water pressure. The atmosphere sits on top of, on top of the world and, you know, we're down here. And so it's atmospheric pressure is, is higher it's because we're really just breathing in a thin version of water. You know, it's, it's H2O is water, but in what we're breathing is four parts nitrogen to one part oxygen. The bigger question though, is the power of vacuum, because I, I recently interviewed a guy, a vacuum expert, an industrial vacuum expert who oh, yeah. was making... The, 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 is it the torques? Is yeah, tor. So vacuums tor. vacuums are measured in units of tor, T-O-R-R, -R, and yeah. which sounds like an alien thing, but it is, it's T-O-R-R. -R, and it's very, very hard to, once you get up to the point where, because you're trying to create a perfect vacuum where there's no molecules in the chamber at all. That's that's really really tough to do, especially down here. He goes, you have to use multiple layers of machines. So like you get use one machine to pull out ninety percent, and then a bigger machine to pull out you know another five percent, and another machine to pull out the last two percent. He goes the last he goes the last part when you're pulling out the mo molecules to make a clean chamber. He goes, you can't even use raw horsepower to do it. There isn't enough horsepower to do it. It, it cannot be done. You have to do it chemically through a leaching process. And you're saying, okay, what's your point? Vacuums are very strong. We know this. Even down here, you take a Hoover vacuum or whatever they call them now, and you, you could you know, pick up a bowling ball, you know, off the off the ground. The point is, a vacuum can counteract gravity all day long because gravity is a constant force, and a vacuum is variable. We can we can make vacuums whatever we want. We can't make variable gravity even now. Our civilization is stuck to our, a certain type of gravity. My question is, if the ultimate vacuum power, which is the absence of anything in space is literally right next to our fluffy cloudy smoky atmosphere yeah how is that yeah. atmosphere how, that work? how is that staying on there because we remember and, and fine if you want to say that oxygen and nitrogen staying on the ground and that's being held down by gravity fine I, i'll give you that just for the argument's sake tell me about the uh, the uh, all the other molecules that are lighter than that though that are hovering around the upper part of the atmosphere like helium we know rises hydrogen fluorocarbons ozone they're they're all up there they're literally at the bleeding edge of space how are those things not being ripped off ripped off of our atmosphere how is our atmosphere here at all and i'm still you know people say well and, and the argument from science Oh, it, it bugs me because they're, they're, the ends justify the means. It's like, well, it's got to be gravity because if it isn't gravity, we wouldn't have an atmosphere. It's like, yeah, I suppose you could use that as an argument, but you're really saying, well, it has to be because if it isn't, we'd all be dead. Or it would be enclosed. And you'd have or it'd be enclosed. Yes. If, it, if we were in a pressurized system and that, you know, enclosed, pressurized. That's how you would do it. There were for there is no vacuum of space. Everything can rise up to the top. But yes, and and that by the way, that also takes into account the buoyancy thing. If you're kind of working on gravity, I still think it's a well, gravity, but I think it's an enclosed pressurized system. The thing, the thing with uh, the uh, heliocentric uh, global idea of gravity. Okay, all, we're all pulled toward the core. Mm -hmm. So if I'm at the equator versus at the North Pole, and the equator's 
you know, the, the Earth is spinning around a thousand miles an hour. Mm-hmm. Gravity, in part, is keeping me from going out of space. So it looks like gravity there would have to be higher than right. it would be at the North Pole. In or fact, or things would have to be lighter. Or yes. things would have to be lighter. But, yeah. but they're not. No, they're not. And I, I, in fact, I proposed this, oh boy, two years ago now, where I said, oh, because people are, it's the merry-go-round technique, which is everyone knows as a child, you know, on a merry-go-round, if you're on the outer edge, you're going to be thrown off into the monkey bars. But if you're in the center, <laughs> you're not being, you're not feeling anything. You're just standing there. You're just turning in a circle, which means the, the centrifugal force is nothing in the center or at the top of a globe, spinning globe, but it's maximized at the equator. So technically, and we've got some really, really accurate measuring devices now, an object, you take a 10 pound weight on the North Pole, you make sure it measures exactly 10 pounds and you move it to the equator, it should weigh slightly less. Because or, remember, or even a good bit less. It should well, weigh less. It should, it should weigh, weigh less. less. And I've never heard of anything remotely saying that, that that's the case. And you're saying, well, I didn't prove anything. Okay, I'll, I'll give you one more. And that is, let's say the merry-go-round technique, you know, because water moves very easily. Water responds to gravity very well because it's a liquid. And water... For example, like you're you're driving with a cup of coffee in your hand, you make a sharp left hand turn. You got to watch it because that water, you know, that coffee's going mm-hmm. somewhere, right? And that's just that's just a car. Tell me how the the centrifugal force, that merry-go-round force at the equator, is not bunching up a whole bunch of that water, all our oceans, like Saturn's rings. I'm not saying that they should be flying around the world or anything, but there should be a big bulge of water at the center and there should be bald spots at the northern and southern poles there should be why is the water completely uniform how is gravity counteracting everything about the centrifugal force everything every last iota it shouldn't shouldn't be the case i go on and on but you you see where i'm going with that oh yeah it it it, the the whole thing with water and um it it doesn't it doesn't make a whole lot of sense and and even even the uh, what was the um, kind of famous experiment that was done on the uh, channels? I don't know if it was oh, the, the one out in England, and I can't yeah. remember the name for it because I I usually don't even reference it. That's why I, yeah. I can't remember that was, it. That was like in the eighteen hundreds. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. Well, of course, now, nowadays we just shoot long distance photography. You know, oh, now, yeah. nowadays we have HD cameras. We can shoot anything. You know, the only, and, and I know people, some people don't like me saying this <clears throat> because one of the arguments is, well, if, if the, if the world is flat, then you should be, why can't we see Japan from California? And my argument would be, well, if you pulled off the atmosphere, you might be able to, well, if yeah, you had a good yeah, enough camera. And, be, and pilots, you know, on, you know, clear can see a long, long look. ways. There was, yeah. remember that SR-71 pilot that came out recently, I think it was this year, as a matter of oh. fact. From like Nevada to yeah, he could Los see, Angeles or something. No, from Arizona. Arizona. He got up high enough to where he could see Los Angeles from Arizona. And that sh- that's a long, long, long way. And, yeah. and it's like, okay. And now either he was now, depending, he could have been lying about his altitude because, you know, they're never going to give the exact specs on that thing. But he could also said that he could see the entire Rocky Mountains all the way up to Canada when he was getting up towards New Mexico. I'm going, I don't think you should be able to see that. The point is, is the atmosphere we breathe is so thick is that you can't, you can only see so far, uh, but he was above it. That was different. He, he was above it. Now down, down here at sea level or remotely close to sea level, you can still see a long, long, long way, but there's only remember you can only see so far because of all the nitrogen and oxygen. You pull that out of the equation. I think you could see a very, very long way again, which is, <clears throat> exactly what we do in um when you're in uh, the the simulated world which is because there's technically no atmosphere <clears throat> oh sorry hang on a glass of water <clears throat> we're almost done right yeah 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 the um <clears throat> the uh in in simulations the uh there is no atmosphere you're not breathing anything nobody's you know you, you see the lungs moving but you're not actually breathing anything because uh, you don't have any organs or anything like that so when you're looking at across a horizon, <clears throat> the distance you can see is literally just a toggle setting 
to where you can say, you know, show show me the, the amount of distance we should see. Now, if it was a curved Earth, that shouldn't be possible because the distance you should see should be completely related to the curvature. But since we never, ever build in curvature, it's it's just a toggle setting. I wanted to make one one other little point. Uh, I was listening. As you were doing a radio show with somebody. Anyway, they, they kind of got on this thing about what I don't think the Russians and the, and the U.S. ever cooperated with the space thing. And you were saying, well, yeah, they, they, they did. And I immediately thought of something that if you're from the South, uh, or at least around here, you'll 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 know about is. Uh, Wrestling. We don't call it wrestling. We call it wrestling. Right. And I used to work out with a wrestler named uh, Chick Donovan, Golden Boy Chick Donovan. Okay. And he'd tell you, he said, "Man, we go at each other in these interviews, but you know, we after the match we get together and I'll have a beer. You know, we're all friends, and you know, it's just putting on a face." Oh yeah, Thank yeah, you. and. Yeah. When it comes to the Russian, and, and I had an ABC News correspondent give me give me a little grief. It was the only time she raised her eyebrow at me, because she she said, "Well, you're talking that you know we're we're not we're not enemies with the Russians." I go, "No, no, of course we're not. We posture to, to that extent, but most people, and it's really uh, relative to how old you are, because if you go way way back, I mean, it was right after World War II it ended." And all of a sudden, you know, the communist threat and better dead than red and all this other crap. And we continue that into the what the Cuban Missile Crisis in the 60s. And then in the 70s, we really didn't do much. But in the 80s, oh, my God, uh, how many movies did we make that had involved the Russians? And it was all movies. Sylvester Stallone in the entire Rambo series. Uh, what was that movie? Um, Red Dawn. Oh, that was the quintessential yeah, Red Dawn. Yeah, Red, yeah. Red Dawn. Yeah, where, well, where the, there, there's got to be somebody for us to hate. There's got to yeah. be, yeah. And and that was it. So Russia and uh, at, yeah, at the lowest levels, of course, if you put Russian troops and Soviet troops in the same area, they might actually square off at each other. But you'd actually have to get them there. It's never gonna happen. Well, they are our secret brothers. And and let me kind of uh, I'll kind of wrap it up with with this this story. And I, I know you probably heard me say this story. Because I, I again, I was like the Russians and the and the Soviets. I'm sorry, the Soviet Union. We call them the Russians now, but it was really the Soviet Union back then, the USSR. And the Amer the Americans were in on this, on the whole flat Earth thing since day one. They were down on the ice together when they figured it out. And and, and I mean it when I say the Russians or the Soviet Union has been around and been the secret ally of the United States for a long, long time because you want somebody secret. It's great storytelling. It's a great plot line twist where it is the, you, the, the two biggest kids on the block. There's a reason why we've never, ever squared off. Find me a, a, a conflict where the Russians and us, we're talking 50, 60 years now, have ever squared off over anything where our troops are on the ground and their troops are on the ground and we're killing each other. It's never, ever happened. And it started all the way back in the Civil War. It's a, it's a fun little story. It's a mythological story, but it's a good story, and I absolutely believe it. And that is, people don't, don't remember that the United States, because we forget our history, that the United States and Great Britain, you know, Great Britain wanted to own the United States for a long time. The Revolutionary War was about that. <clears throat> which was about, you know, the, people say, oh, no, it was the Americans. We kicked, you know, Great Britain's ass. No, we didn't. It was the French. There's a reason why the we Louisiana Purchase happened. It's because we had to buy back all the land from France after they won the war for us. The War of 1812 happened, where, or Britain came in again. And that was the one, that's the war we, by the way, we don't even talk to teach kids about anymore, where they came into Northern Canada, marched down to the White House, burned it down, and said, oh, we got these guys. Let's go back, finish off Napoleon, then we'll come back and take America. And America scrambling during that entire time, and sure enough, Napoleon did lose, and the Britons thought, okay, we won't come in through Canada, we'll come in through Louisiana. They came in, this is your neck of the woods, they came in through Louisiana, they were thwarted by who? Andrew Jackson, who is now on the $20 bill because he became a war hero because of that. But the third and final time that the, uh, Great Britain tried to take the United States was during the Civil War. It had nothing to do with slavery. It had nothing to do with the, the economics between the North and the South. It was Great Britain trying to get one last shot at it. And what they did was they posted advisors. They, it was brilliant. It was foolproof. It was going to work. And that was they completely had everybody in the in the South. They, they had built them their entire Navy. They got all the advisors. All the arms came from Britain. It was going to be the Great Britain Navy 
and the South versus the North. And that would have been a completely, mm -hmm. completely different fight. It wouldn't have been this five year knockdown drag out where the South was, was going to lose. It was going to be, the, it would have been a really tough fight. And the story goes like this, where uh, Abraham Lincoln and the North was scared to death and they were going, holy smokes, we, we may have a problem here. And so they sent a letter off to the Tsar of Russia. I think it was Nicholas I at the time. And it's, it's the famous story where uh, Nicholas gets this letter from Lincoln, you know, because a lot of leaders liked Lincoln back in the day. And he goes, he opens this in front of his chief of staff and he goes, he goes just so you know, whatever he asked for, we're going to do it. And it was a very, very simple request, which was, it said, keep Great Britain out of the war. Keep them out. And so Russia contacted England and they said, if your Navy comes in, our Navy comes in. And which would have been the very first world war. It would have been fantastic. Oh, yeah. It would have been, I mean, can you imagine the Russians against Britain? You know, you got the North and the South and the balance. Oh, it would have been an epic war. But the Britain said, all right, fine, screw you guys. And that, that was it. Russia didn't even have to fire a shot, but there was a caveat. And that is, we did this for you. You owe us. So you could sing there. Oh, there's no proof to this. I'm going, really? Look up at the very end of the war. What happened at the end of the Civil War after, you know, because the South was hung out to dry, basically. And, yeah. and the North won. So at the end of the war, even though both sides were hugely in debt, I mean, there was damage all over the place. I mean, we really did a lot of damage. The United States was almost forced for whatever reason they made a huge land purchase from russia which still exists to this day and you know what it is um what? yes you do alaska alaska that's right yeah that's right. they yeah. bought alaska literally right after that war ended kind of like you owe us we're calling in our marker now of course we got something out of it because it was at the time remember because that's where russia ended remember the Bering strait russia and alaska <laughs> russia owned that whole chunk up there and they uh we we initially found out there was oil so it worked out for us in the end and we got the alaskan pipeline and there's a lot of cool stuff but that that has never changed the the alliance between the russians and the americans has always been there at the highest level yes the troops hate each other officially but on the turn you know, you, you wait if it ever comes down to it the russians will be with us uh for i think so too so, I think so too. anyway you know the uh just real real, real quick mm -hmm. the uss liberty story the the uh during the seven days war the reconnaissance ship the uss liberty uh supposedly was well according to survivors was attacked on by israel under well under alleged orders from johnson in order to and this goes back to your conspiracy roots to get um egypt involved in the war which we would then blame it on egypt okay. anyway they had been sprayed and bombarded by these unwilling israeli fighters they didn't want to do it they were under direct orders and uh, a russian submarine popped up and they said game's over plans over and uh, the uss liberty was able to you know somehow get back into port with only i think there was like 40 or 50 casualties but they were going yeah. Supposedly, LBJ said, "I want that blank, blank ship at the bottom of the ocean." Yep. So yep. that was a. Uh, I think you know. I ain't got anything against Russia. Yeah, like exactly. It, it's it for me. It's like look, nobody people keep forgetting. It's kind of like the, the the how there's no no pictures of the Earth from space for all for that long a time. It's like look find me any other thing where it's like oh yeah they're the bad guys they're the two biggest bullies on the block never squared off. Come on. Never? It's like we yeah. had all these opportunities. I would have thought at the very least, I mean, that was the, the big scare tactic during the 80s. Never happened. And it's, even now, the headlines, even today, the headlines, it's like, oh, Russia this and Russia that. Like, come on. The, the thing that I admire about uh, Russia is their nationalist versus globalist. And uh, you know, to me, it's, it's less about countries than the nationalist and globalist. And, you know, you get your globalist involved and... Yeah. Uh, to me, that's the real evil empire, but, yeah. you know, yeah, that's, that's I, a whole other conspiracy. <laughs> yeah, for, it was like, look, anyone has any doubt, look, Russia saved, Russia was the ones that, that uh, kept World War II, kept the United States from, from becoming German. Uh, yeah. they, they sacrificed yeah. a huge amount. They wow. lost a lot of guys. 
So yeah. don't don't think that Russia uh, is is the the villain here. They're not. Yeah. yeah. Well, all right, my friend, and tell us again uh, when when uh, you, the the Georgetown I think is a video, but the UCLA has it. I, we, no, up? we haven't we haven't gotten a date yet, uh, but it'll be I would imagine next month. Okay. For you, for you, Are you still doing the uh, hot potatoes with Patricia? Uh, currently, I am not doing hot potatoes with Patricia. I'm, I'm taking a break from most of my other things. I am concentrating right now on Strange World and taking the fight directly to mainstream science. Uh, and uh, again, let me grab the. Well, I've got the book here. Uh, Flat Earth Clues, yep. you can get it on, uh, what's the best for Amazon? Amazon, you can buy the book on Amazon if you want. There's an audio book as well through Audibles, I believe. And, of course, you could listen to it on YouTube. All you have to do is type in Flat Earth Clues. And, and I want to I compliment you on your YouTube thing simply because, uh, one, they're all excellent. And another thing, I have never heard you use profanity uh, you know, I'll, I'll listen to other YouTubers, and I think, God, this is really good. And they'll say, you know, mirror this, use this. And every other word is F-U, F-U, F-U. I can't use that. Yeah. You know, I can't use that on yeah. radio. I, uh, I try to keep it clean if I can. And, and it's, it's really good. Well, and you. every Tuesday night, True Frequency Radio, um, 10 o'clock Eastern, 7 o'clock Pacific. Is that right? That's right. That's right. And uh, it always has great gifts. Gift, gift. <laughs> I feel you are a gift to us. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get more guests, but yeah, we've, we've had a lot of great, great people on so far. And with that, Mark, I will let you go. And uh, I was just going to let us go with some back in the USR, but I think there's probably some copyright things. There might be. That. So uh, <laughs> being the Beatles, it probably is. So I will see everyone else next week, uh, right. Lord willing. Uh, and Mark, again, thank you so much. Have a wonderful Christmas, a great new year, and uh, uh, gun ho with 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 all your good work. Thank you. I, again, I, I, you know, if you believe in the Bible, you believe in flat Earth, and so I believe you're doing God's work. And uh, you know, that's that's my belief. That's well, my belief. Well, thank you. I, I, all right, my friend. Thank you so much. All right, you have a good one. All right. You too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.